Chapter 6, Learning Objective 1. Calculate cost of goods sold and merchandise inventory using specific identification, first in first out or FIFO, and weighted average cost flow assumptions under a perpetual inventory system. Determining the cost of each unit of inventory and thus the total cost of ending inventory on the balance sheet can be challenging. The cost of inventory can be affected by discounts, returns, transportation costs, and shrinkage, as we saw in earlier chapters. The purchase cost of an inventory item can be different from one purchase to the next, and some types of inventory flow in and out of the warehouse in a specific sequence while others don't. For example, milk would need to be managed so that the oldest milk is sold first, while a car dealership has no control over which vehicles are sold because the customer makes specific choices based on what's available. So how is the cost of a unit of merchandise and inventory actually determined? Well, there are several methods that can be used, and each method may result in a different cost, and we'll explore them now. First, let's assume a company sells only one product and uses the perpetual inventory system. It has no beginning inventory at June 1st, 2023, and the company purchased five units during June at a different price at each purchase date, starting at $1 per unit and increasing up to $5 per unit. At June 28th, there are five units in inventory with a total cost of $15. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. Assume 4 units are sold on June 30th for $10 each on account. The cost of the 4 units sold could be determined based on identifying the costs associated with the specific units sold, like in a car dealership for example. A business that sells perishable items would want the oldest units to move out of inventory first to minimize spoilage. If large quantities of a low dollar value item are in inventory, such as pencils or hammers, an average cost might be used to calculate cost of goods sold. A business may choose one of three methods to calculate cost of goods sold and the resulting ending inventory based on an assumed flow. Those assumed inventory flows are 1. Specific identification, 2. First in, first out, or FIFO, and 3. Weighted average. Under specific identification, each inventory item that is sold is matched with its purchase cost. This is the most practical when inventory consists of relatively few, expensive items, particularly when individual units can be identified with serial numbers like a car. Assume the four units sold on June 30th are those purchased on June 1st, 5th, 7th, and 28th. The fourth unit purchased on June 21st remains in any inventory. The cost of goods sold would be $11, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 5 based on their cost. Sales would total $40, 4 units at $10. So gross profit would be $29, calculated as $40 minus the $11 cost of goods sold. Ending inventory would be $4, which is the cost of the unit purchased on June 21st. The general ledger T accounts for merchandise inventory and cost of goods sold would show each of the purchases as debits to the merchandise inventory account and the transfer of the $11 cost of goods sold for merchandise inventory on June 30th. The entries to record the June 30 sale on account would include a debit to accounts receivable for $40, along with a credit to sales for the same amount, followed by the cost matching entry which includes a debit to cost of goods sold and a corresponding credit to merchandise inventory for the $11 cost. It's not possible to use specific identification when inventory consists of a large number of similar, inexpensive items that can't be easily differentiated. Consequently, a method of assigning cost to inventory items based on an assumed flow of goods can be adopted. That's where the other methods of first in, first out and weighted average come in. Under FIFO, it's assumed that the first goods purchased are the first ones sold. And this method makes most sense when inventory consists of perishable items such as groceries or other time-sensitive goods. Now, using the information for our previous example, the first four units purchased are assumed to be the first four units sold under FIFO. So the cost of the four units sold would be $10, calculated as 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus $4. Sales still equal $40, so the gross profit under FIFO is now $30, calculated as $40 in sales minus $10 cost of goods sold. The cost of the one remaining unit in inventory at the end of the month would be the cost of the fifth unit purchased at $5, or the most recent one. Here's what the T accounts for merchandise inventory and cost of goods sold look like under FIFO. 
Notice we still have all of the same debits into merchandise inventory, but the only difference is the cost of goods sold, which is now $10. So that's the amount credited to inventory and debited to the cost of goods sold account. The entries to record the June 30th sale on account would be almost identical as under specific identification, with a debit to accounts receivable and credit to sales for $40, along with a debit to cost of goods sold and credit to merchandise inventory, but this time for the $10 cost instead of $11. Lastly, there's the weighted average cost flow assumption. Under this flow assumption, goods purchased on different dates are mixed with each other. Now this is popular in practice because it's easy to calculate and is also suitable when inventory is held in common storage facilities. For example, when several crude oil shipments are stored in one large holding tank. This method is best used when there is no differentiation between units of a product, such as barrels of oil, or boxes of cornflakes, valves, etc. To calculate the weighted average cost in our example, the purchase prices for all five units are totaled and equal $15. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. And then divided by the total number of units purchased, in this case which is 5. Therefore, the weighted average cost for each unit is $3, or $15, divided by 5. The weighted average cost of goods sold would be $12. Four units sold at an average cost of $3 each. Sales are still $40, resulting in a gross profit under weighted average inventory of $28, or $40 minus the $12 cost. The cost of the one remaining unit in any inventory is $3. Here's what the T accounts for merchandise inventory and cost of goods sold look like under the weighted average cost flow assumption. Again, we still have all the same debits into the merchandise inventory, and again, the only difference is the cost of goods sold, which is now $12, based on the weighted average calculation. So that's the amount that's credited to inventory and debited to cost of goods sold. The entries to record the June 30th sale on account would be almost identical as under specific identification and FIFO, with the only difference being the cost of goods sold amount, which is $12. Now let's go through a comprehensive example. Under the perpetual inventory system, cost of goods sold is calculated and recorded in the accounting system at the time sales are recorded. In our simplified example, all sales occurred on June 30th after all the inventory had been purchased. However, in reality, the purchases and sales of merchandise is continuous. So to demonstrate the calculations when purchases and sales occur continuously throughout the accounting period, let's review a more comprehensive example. Assume the same example as we just used, except that the sales of units occur on June 3rd, 8th, 23rd, and 29th. To help with the calculation of cost of goods sold, an inventory record card will be used to track individual transactions. This card, or table, records information about purchases such as the date, number of units purchased, and the purchase cost per unit. It records the cost of goods sold information, the date of the sale, number of units sold, and the cost of each item sold. It also records the balance of units on hand, the cost of each unit on hand, and the total cost of units on hand. So here's our partially completed inventory record card. We have a column for the date of each purchase and sale transaction, unit cost, and total cost for purchases, returns, and discounts. We also have columns for the number of units sold, along with the applicable unit cost and total cost of goods sold. And then we have a set of columns for the balance in inventory, which includes the number of units, the related unit cost, and total cost. The quickest way to set this up is to identify all of the dates involved for when both purchases and sales occur and enter the quantities purchased in the units purchase column and the units sold in the related cost of goods sold column. See here, we have purchases of one unit each on June 1st, 5th, 7th, 21st, and 28th, and then sales of one unit each on June 3rd, 8th, 23rd, and 29th. Then we can determine the ending balance in inventory after each sale or purchase. For example, on June 1st, there's one unit purchased and no unit sold resulting in one unit in ending inventory. Then on June 3rd, a unit is sold resulting in zero units inventory. Then there's a purchase on June 5th resulting in one unit in inventory, followed by a purchase on June 7th resulting in two units in ending inventory, followed by a sale on June 8th leaving one unit in ending inventory. You should pause the video and follow through these purchases and sales to confirm the ending inventory of one unit after the June 29th sale. This represents the inventory at the end of the accounting period according to the accounting records.
A physical inventory count must still be done, generally at the end of the fiscal year, to verify the quantities actually on hand. Any discrepancies identified by the physical count are adjusted for a shrinkage as we discussed in Chapter 5. As purchases and sales are made, the costs are assigned to goods using the chosen cost flow assumption. This information is used to calculate the cost of goods sold amount for each transaction at the time of sale. And these costs will vary depending on the inventory cost flow assumption used. And the cost of sales may also vary depending on when sales occur. Now we'll apply each of the cost flow assumptions to this example starting with specific identification. To apply specific identification, we need information about which items are sold on each date. So assume that the specific units were sold as detailed here. The June 3rd sale is for the unit purchased on June 8th. The June 8th sale is for the unit purchased on June 7th, etc. If we now fill in the details in our inventory record or table, let's work through this from the beginning. We start with the June 1st purchase of one unit at a cost of $1 per unit for a total cost of $1 with no sales resulting in any inventory at a unit cost of $1 for a total cost of $1. On June 3rd, that unit is sold and we attach the related cost of $1, resulting in total cost of goods sold of $1, and ending inventory of zero units, and therefore zero cost. On June 5th, one unit was purchased for $2, for a total of $2, with no sales that day, resulting in ending inventory of one physical unit at a cost of $2 per unit for a total of $2. On June 7th, another unit is purchased, at a cost of $3 for a total cost of $3. No sales occurred on June 7th, so there were two units in ending inventory, one at a cost of $2 and the other at a cost of $3 for a total of $5. Then we have a sale on June 8th for one unit, and the unit sold was the one purchased on June 7th. So we mark down a unit cost of $3, resulting in one unit left in inventory with an associated cost of $2, for total inventory value of $2. This unit in inventory is still from the June 5th purchase. Moving on to our next transaction, there's a purchase on June 21st for one unit at a cost of $4 for a total purchase cost of $4, resulting in two physical units in ending inventory, one with a cost of $2 from the June 5th purchase and one from the June 21st purchase with a cost of $4. The total inventory cost of these two units is now $6. Then there's a sale of one unit on June 23rd, and that's for the item purchased on June 5th. So the associated unit cost is $2 for a total cost of goods sold of $2, leaving one unit in any inventory with a unit cost of $4. Next, there's another purchase on June 28th for one unit at a cost of $5 for a total purchase cost of $5. And there are now two units in inventory, one with a cost of $4 and the other with a unit cost of $5 for a total inventory value of $9. Then we have a sale on June 29th for the item purchased on June 28th. So the $5 cost is attached to that, resulting in cost of goods sold of $5, leaving one unit in any inventory at a cost of $4. We can include some basic checks in our sheet as well. The number of units sold plus the units in any inventory always equals the total number of units that were available for sale, regardless of which inventory cost flow method is used. The total number of units purchased is 5, and the total number of units sold is 4, leaving 1 unit in any inventory. We can also confirm our costs in the same way. The total cost of units purchased is $15, and the total cost of goods sold is $11, and the ending inventory value is $4, or $15 minus $11. Now we'll apply the first in, first out, or FIFO cost flow assumption. We start with the June 1st purchase and then the June 3rd sale. Since only one unit was purchased on June 1st, that unit must have been the one sold on June 3rd, so the cost here is the same as with specific identification. Then there are purchases on June 5th and 7th, at $2 and $3 respectively, resulting in ending inventory of two units for a total of $5. The June 8th sale is now where things change. The unit sold will be the first one purchased, which was on June 5th, with a cost of $2, leaving one unit in inventory at $3 per unit. 
Then we have the June 21st purchase at $4, leaving two units in inventory, one at $3 and the other at $4 for a total of $7. The June 23rd sale will come from the oldest item in inventory, which is from the June 7th purchase at $3, leaving the $4 item in inventory from the June 21st purchase. Then there's a purchase on June 28th at $5, and inventory now consists of two units, one at a cost of $4, and the other at a cost of $5 for a total of $9. Finally, there's the sale on June 29th, and that item would be the oldest one from inventory, which is the June 21st purchase at a cost of $4 per unit, leaving one unit in stock at a cost of $5. And that's the last item that was purchased on June 28th. When calculating the cost of units sold under FIFO, the oldest unit in inventory will always be the first one removed. For example, on the previous figure, on June 8th, one unit is sold when the previous balance in inventory consisted of two units. One purchase on June 5th that cost $2, and one unit purchase on June 7th that cost $3. Because the unit costing $2 was in inventory first, before the June 8th unit costing $3, the cost assigned to the unit sold on June 8th is $2. Under FIFO, the first unit into inventory are assumed to be the first units removed from inventory when calculating cost of goods sold. Therefore, under FIFO, ending inventory will always be the most recent units purchased. In the table, there is one unit in ending inventory and it's assigned the $5 cost from the most recent purchase, which was on June 28th. We can apply the same checks for inventory quantity and cost of goods sold as with specific identification. There were five total units purchased. 4 units sold, leaving 1 unit inventory. The cost of goods available for sale was $15, again the same under specific identification, but the cost of goods sold is now $10 instead of $11, resulting in an inventory value of $5 instead of $4 under specific identification. Last, we have the weighted average cost flow assumption. When a perpetual inventory system is used, the weighted average is calculated each time a purchase is made. For example, after the June 7th purchase, the balance in inventory is two units with a total cost of $5, one unit at $2 plus one unit at $3, resulting in an average cost per unit of $2.50, or $5 divided by two units. When a sale occurs, the cost of the sale is based on the most recent average cost per unit. For example, the cost of the sale on June 3rd uses the $1 average cost per unit from June 1st, while the sale on June 8th uses the $2.50 average cost per unit from June 7th. For consistency, all weighted average calculations will be rounded to two decimal places. So here's our inventory card. This time, we're using the average unit cost in the middle inventory column here. Up to June 5th, everything here is the same as with specific identification in FIFO, since one item was purchased, then sold, and then another item purchased. But now on June 7th is where things change. An item is purchased at $3 and there are no sales. Now there are two units in inventory for a total cost of $5, the $2 item already in inventory, plus the $3 for the item just purchased. We now calculate average cost by taking the $5 total cost divided by the two units in inventory for $2.50 per unit. Then when the item is sold on June 8th, the cost of goods applied now is at that average cost of $2.50, leaving one unit in stock at a cost of $2.50. Then we have a purchase on June 21st for $4, with no sales, resulting in two units in inventory, now at a total cost of $6.50, $2.50 in inventory plus the $4 item purchased, and now we calculate a new average cost of $3.25 by taking $6.50 in total cost divided by the two units in inventory. For the June 23rd sale, the item sold will have the new weighted average cost of goods sold of $3.25 applied, leaving one unit in inventory at a cost of $3.25. On June 28th, an item is purchased for $5, resulting in two units in inventory with a total value of $8.25, that's $3.25 left in inventory after the previous sale, plus the $5 purchase, and that results in an average unit cost now of $4.13, calculated as $8.25 divided by 2. On June 29th, 
The item sold will have the $4.13 cost attached to it, resulting in one item left in inventory at a cost of $4.13, or $4.12 with a small rounding difference. Take note here that the average cost changes only when there is a purchase and never when there's a sale. The cost of goods sold plus the balance in inventory must equal the cost of goods available for sale, as highlighted here. Again, there were still five units available for sale and four units sold, leaving one unit in ending inventory. The total cost of goods available were still $15, but now, based on averaging, the total cost of goods sold was $10.88, resulting in ending inventory of $4.12, confirming our work is correct. Now here's a comparison of the results of the three costful methods. Cost of goods available for sale, units sold, and units in ending inventory are the same regardless of which method is used. Because each cost flow method allocates the cost of goods available for sale in a particular way, the cost of goods sold and ending inventory values are different for each method. The information in the inventory record is used to prepare the journal entries for the general journal. For example, the credit sale on June 23rd using weighted average costing would be recorded with a debit to accounts receivable for $10 and a corresponding credit to sales of the same amount. The matched cost of goods sold entry includes a debit or increase to cost of goods sold expense of $3.25 and a credit or decrease to merchandise inventory of $3.25. Perpetual inventory incorporates an internal control, which is a feature that's lost under the periodic inventory method. Losses resulting from theft and error can easily be determined when the actual quantity of goods on hand is counted and compared with the quantity shown in the inventory records as being on hand. Computerization has made record keeping so much easier and less expensive because the inventory accounting system can be tied into the sales system so inventory is updated whenever a sale is recorded. Remember the beeps from the Walmart example. As for the inventory record card, for a business that carries large volumes of many different types of inventory, the General Ledger Merchandise account contains only summarized transactions of purchases and sales. The detailed transactions for each type of inventory would be recorded in the underlying inventory record cards. The inventory record card is an example of a subsidiary ledger, more commonly called a subledger. The Merchandise Inventory Subledger provides a detailed listing of the type amount, and total cost of all types of inventory held at a particular point in time. The sum of the balances on each inventory record card in the subledger would always equal the ending amount recorded in a merchandise inventory in the general ledger. A subledger contains all the detail for each product in inventory, while the general ledger account shows only a summary. The general ledger information is streamlined while allowing for detail to be available through the subledger. There are also other types of subledgers, such as the Accounts Receivable Subledger and Accounts Payable Subledger, which will be introduced in later chapters.